you all for being here. I, I thought that maybe tonight I should start off first with an apology because some of you are starting to be familiar faces and I know the candidates are. So you're hearing the same things over and over again and I apologize for that at the outset, but there are a number of you who don't know anything about me, so I thought I'd start out and tell you a little bit about me. Um, one of the things I haven't told the people before is that um, you'll see me on the ballot, Sharon Swartz Newhart, and the Swartz is my maiden name, and I always use it on my formal documents because it's my father's name, and uh, my father had four girls. He gave up uh, with his fourth daughter. My dad's name was Robert Earl Swartz. He gave up on that. We named my sister Roberta Erlene, and that was it. <laughs> so uh, that's why I use Swartz so much. Uh, I was born in Dayton. My father was a city of Dayton policeman. My grandfather was a city of Dayton fireman. I grew up in Northwest Dayton, and I went to Dayton Public Schools. After <coughs> one of Dayton Public Schools, I went to Northwestern University, and somebody went in the group, we were talking about that, and I went the good old-fashioned way on scholarships and work study and loans. And after Northwestern, I went to Georgetown Law School, same way, and uh, then I came back here to practice business law, and I've been back in the Miami Valley ever since then. I'm in private practice with a, a law firm that name is Thompson Hine, and I've been in private practice my entire career except for two and a half years when I was general counsel at LexisNexis. I live now in Greene County. In uh, oh, a little over 17 years ago, my husband and I moved our family out to Greene County. We bought a farm that's on the northern border of Yellow Springs, um, between uh, Yellow Springs and Young's Jersey Dairy. So I know everybody knows where Young's is, so we don't live too far from there. And one of the things that we've done with our farm is to put a conservation easement on the farm so the farm is protected. It can never be developed. It will always be farmland or green space. And the Tecumseh Land Trust, which holds the easement on our farm and 15,000 other acres in Green and Clark County has their headquarters on our farm. Um, in 2008, I ran for Congress in the Ohio 7th Congressional District, and Ohio 7 was then an open seat because Dave Hobson was retiring. It was an open seat, and Ohio 7 goes Green and Clark County, eight counties over, drops down and picks up Perry County on south in southeast Ohio. If you, back in 2008, if you looked up the word gerrymander on Wikipedia, you saw a diagram of Ohio 7 there. And um, I learned a lot of things when I ran for Congress in 2008. I ran a hell of a good campaign, but I, but I learned one big thing, and that is that uh, it's not really smart to run in a gerrymandered um, congressional district that's heavily gerrymandered for the Republicans if you're a Democrat. So what's different about this time? And you all should know and, uh, now about how the, our new congressional district has been reconfigured. The, it's now called the Ohio 10th Congressional District. It um, includes all of Montgomery County, all of Greene, and a little piece of Fayette County. So what's great about this district is the last time Montgomery County was all together as a district, it was represented for years by a Democrat. Montgomery County is 75% of the district, and so it makes this district, as opposed to old Ohio 7, very competitive. Um, the campaign for accountable redistricting says this is one of three competitive districts in the state. So this is really, really a great opportunity for a pickup by the Democrats. Now, since I announced that I'm running, I've been putting together an organization, I've been raising money, I've been out talking to people, people like you, people <coughs> all over, um, to tell them what I'm about and, and, and about my campaign. Um, I just last Friday got the endorsement from the Ohio AFL-CIO. I've been uh, working really, really hard, and I think that um, there's a couple of things apart from uh, my, my um, understanding from my last race about not running in a heavily gerrymandered district is that that race made me smart and I have I learned a lot in that race and I know how to apply it in this one I'm already talking to the people in Washington that uh, uh, take uh, charge on the Democratic side with the um, congressional races I'm talking to Emily's list I'm reaching out to the groups that we need to get on our side 
because to beat Mike Turner, you're going to have to run smart, not make any mistakes from the start, and you're going to have to get the support of, of all the constituent organizations that are available to help you beat him. And that's what I intend to do, and I'd like to start with the South Bay Unites. Thank you very much. First thing I'd like to say is thank you for being here and to the other, the other people as well for being here because I've tried many times to see uh, Mr. Turner and he's totally unavailable. Perpetually. <laughs> I'm a long time Democrat. I haven't always lived in this country I wasn't born here. But I did just do our income taxes and for I have Medicare and I pay under $1,200 for Medicare for 80% of my health care. For the other 20%, I pay $6,000. Now, I support single payer because that works. It's never been repealed anywhere that it exists in the developed world, which is practically everywhere in the developed world. And I would like to know that the Democrat that I vote for is going to be in line with Teddy Roosevelt, 1912, when this battle started, it's not new, and it's not something we have to wait another 100 years for. We've waited 100 years. There are, I believe, 15 million people with no health care coverage. I want the Democrat I vote for to think it's pretty outrageous to pay $1,200 for, under $1,200 for Medicare, and if I want to protect myself against the possibility I might lose everything, I have this other secondary insurance, and millions of people on Medicare don't or can't buy that secondary insurance. So yeah, I'm very interested to know what your answer to that situation is. I'm, uh, before I answer the question, I wanted to tell you that, did you know that Teddy Roosevelt's great-grandson is now in the Miami Valley. He's uh, the new president of Antioch College. He's a big Democrat, and uh, he ran for governor of uh, Massachusetts back in 94, so it's really funny to have a, so his name is Mark Roosevelt, so we've got uh, Roosevelt right here in our midst now. Well, uh, Franklin had to be pushed by <laughs> and, and uh, Francis Perkins, so I think we've reached a point where you know, a lot of our politicians, if they can be pushed, we, we need to do our job, which is to push them, serve us. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I, I think on the single-payer concept that if I were going back, and we were talking about Franklin Roosevelt's time, and we were putting in all of these safety net programs <coughs> that, and if you look at what's happened in, in the economy, think about it this way. Where would we have been through this recession if we had not had in place the safety nets that the Democrats created for us? Um, just tick them all off, you know, social security, unemployment, food stamps, all of these things, you know, uh, are work programs that the Democrats put into place, and it's probably what saved us from having a, another great depression is the fact that we at least had these safety nets these times. So if I were going to go back and I were looking at this and I were thinking about designing a healthcare system, I definitely think that single payer would have been at the top of my list. The fact is, though, that a lot of time has passed. There's a lot of vested interest in health care, and you saw what a battle it was to get the Affordable Care Act passed. And I think that act has lots of good things in it, <coughs> all of us. And I think there are going to be more good things in it when. Um, when the rest of it comes into effect in 2014. So um, while I'd like to tell you, boy, I'm gonna go to Congress and fight and die for single payer, I just believe that there's no way in this current political environment with the, um, uh, all of the insurance companies, with the, uh, with the hospitals, with everybody that has, uh, and the drug companies have a vested interest in it, there's no way that's gonna get past Congress. So what I would like to do is continue to work for things like uh, getting implemented the Affordable Care Act and making that better. And I happen to believe that what will happen is that over time, and it's probably not going to be in your lifetime or my lifetime, but maybe in my kids, and I don't have any grandkids yet, knock on wood, but um, uh, I think what's going to happen is it'll move toward a single payer system because if you look at things like Medicare, Medicaid, um, with the uh, veterans, Healthcare. What we're finding, at least in the Miami Valley, that is 40% of the people are already on it. 
government health care system. So I think it'll move in that direction, but um, uh, I just don't think it's something that tackling that in the next Congress is the most effective use of my time. It'd be very helpful though if people who <coughs> are elected do not take money from the medical industrial complex. That's, you know, and that's a really hard thing to say to people because uh, um, uh, a lot of these folks are out and they're trying uh, to continue their influence with the Congress people. Now, I don't happen to believe that it's wrong to take money from political action committees. Um, I, there, are, I would, there are a number of political action committees I would never take any money from, but um, uh, I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with it, but I don't think I'd compromise my integrity. I mean... Nobody's going to buy me. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming. It takes a lot of effort to come out and get going on these cold uh, days and get moving. And I'm really glad that you're here, and I'm glad that we're having a spirited conversation. I'm happy to have that. But um, what I wanted to tell you is that this election, above all, is about who is best equipped to beat Mike Turner. If we don't take Mike Turner now, absent him getting hit by a bus or just moving on to bit bigger and better things, we are gonna be stuck with Mike Turner as our congressman until he retires. Now, I am prepared to take him on. I'm prepared to do what's necessary to take him on. I intend to use every resource I can muster to take him on. I'm going to get help out of Washington. I'm going to get help out of Emily's List. I'm going to get help out of everyday citizens. I'm going to get help wherever I can find it. But I will promise you this. No one has ever questioned my integrity. No one has ever said that I can be bought. I, I think if my, my, I can't even describe to you what my father would say as a Dayton policeman about anybody who would ever think that of, of me. It is not true. You have my assurance that I will be there for you when you need me. And I, I would be very grateful for your support come March 6th. Thank you. Thank you.